Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King! On, you huskies! Gold. Gold discovered in Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Yes, siree. Little wonder many a He-Man Hollywood movie star goes for this breakfast. It's swell-tasting Quaker Puff rice or Quaker Puff wheat with milk or cream and fruit. These king-size, ready-to-serve premium grains of rice or wheat pack a man-sized taste wallop. They're good for you. They're shot from guns. Yes, actually exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender as nuts in November. Tomorrow, sure, treat yourself swell. Enjoy this breakfast treat. Eat Quaker Puff rice or Quaker Puff wheat. Ezra Sims and his wife Maggie had spent most of their lives panning for gold from Australia to Nevada and Arizona. And not once had they made a worthwhile strike. Therefore, it was with much misgiving that Maggie, now past 50, listened to Ezra's excited announcement when he rushed into their shabby quarters in Arizona on a very hot day in the fall of 98. Maggie! Maggie, pack up your things. We're pulling out of this diggings. Cool off, Ezra, and don't start telling me somebody's made a strike. I'm not interested. But, Maggie, this is a real gold strike. It'll be bigger than the one made in 49. I've told you before, I've gone on my last gold rush. Oh, Maggie. Ezra, I'm getting too old to chase the rainbow. We are both past 50 when we spent our lives looking for gold. And precious little we found. But, Maggie, 50 and a little past, that's not old. We're bound to make a strike someday if we just keep at it. Oh, you told me that 30 years ago in Sydney when I married you. You told me we'd spend our winters in the Alps and our summers in Spain when you made your strike. Huh. And from that day on, all I've ever seen is deserts, hot burning deserts. Australia, Africa, Arizona. Oh, if I hadn't been a God fearing man, Ezra, I'd sure be scared of eternity come judgment day. Oh. All right, Maggie, guess you're right. At our age, I suppose there's no sense in adding the Yukon to our trail of lost hope. Yeah, you're right. Where'd you say? The Yukon. That's where they just struck gold. The Yukon? Snow. Iceberg 60 below zero. Oh. Well, what's the matter, Maggie? You look like you're in a trance. Oh, Ezra, why didn't you say it was the Yukon in the first place? Why didn't you say it wasn't a strike in another desert? Another hot burning desert? You, you mean you, you'd like snow and, and ice and 60 below? After 40 years of hot burning deserts, the Yukon sounds like heaven to me. Ezra, we're going on that gold strike. <laughs> Ezra and Maggie Sims did join the rush to the Yukon, where they staked a claim a few miles from Indian River and built a cabin. In less than six months, they took out more gold than they had found in their lifetime search for the yellow metal. When they had carefully weighed and sacked an estimated quarter million dollars, Ezra put his arm around his wife and kissed her. He had not forgotten the lavish promises he had made to her 30 years before, promises that had not been fulfilled. Yeah, Maggie, I promised you anything you want. Diamonds, fine clothes, travel to far-off places. Now, Maggie, my darling, just name it and I'll see you get it. Oh, you sweet Ezra. Yes, you are. You've put up with my complaining for a long time. I know I used to pine for far-off places like Switzerland and Spain, but that's all over. Eh? Huh? How do you mean, Maggie? I don't want to go anywhere now. I found the place I've been looking for all the time. It's right here in the Yukon. 
For me, it's heaven, or a big slice of it. Yeah, well, to tell the truth, I feel the same way about it. I like it here, too. But, Matt, how about them other things I promised you? Diamonds, fine clothes. Tell me what you want, Maggie, darling. No matter what it costs, I'll get it. <laughs> well, there's something I want, all right. Yeah? I want them more than anything else. That string of pearls we saw in that fancy store in Frisco, huh? No, Ezra, it's not pearls I want. Then what is it? I want eggs. Yeah, you are... Uh, what? Regular, everyday hey. eggs. I haven't tasted an egg since we left Tonopah. Now, j just a minute, Maggie. I dream it... about eggs. I'm that hungry for them. But, Maggie... Yes, Ezra, a dozen eggs would make me the happiest woman in the Yukon. Uh, Maggie Sims, do you know what eggs is selling for in Dawson? I don't care what they're selling for. We can pay for them, and I want them. But they're selling for $100 a piece, Maggie. $100 for an egg. Oh, you promised me you'd buy me anything I wanted, Ezra. Uh, yes, I know I did. It's eggs I want, and it's eggs I'm going to get. Oh, Maggie, a hundred dollars for an egg. A cold storage egg. Two days later, a fast border launch nosed into the landing at Porcupine, a lumber camp located on the upper reaches of the Indian River. From the seclusion of a drying shed, two bearded men in lumberjack garb watched the lone occupant of the boat make fast his craft, pick up a heavy leather bag, and make his way toward a small frame building which was the company's office. Well, Pumpkin, this is what we've been waiting for. He's a paymaster. And the payroll's in that bag he's carrying, Purdy. $10,000 and go. Yeah. I will let him get inside. He'll have to check over things with the clerk. It'll give us time to make sure nobody follows him. How do you mean, Purdy? There's two company boats down there, not counting the launch he came up river in. Oh, yeah. So we'll sneak down and scuttle them. Then when we grab the payroll, we'll take the launch. Now, come on. Make sure they don't see us. The paymaster, Cliff Winters, completed his checking with the clerk, Bill Boyd, who also served as the company's telegrapher. Then he reached into the leather bag and brought out a circular of handbill size. Yeah. Well, where's the bulletin board, Bill? Hmm, just outside the door, Cliff. What do you got there? Orders from the head office? Oh, it's a handbill Sergeant Preston gave me just as I left Dawson. Pictures and descriptions of a couple of men wanted for robbery. Asked me to post it on the camp bulletin board in case they came around here. Oh, let me see it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Look it over. They might drop in on you one of these days. Hmm. Wanted for robbery. Fuzzy Walters and Pumpkin Adams. Hey, Cliff, those guys are on our payroll. Oh. They were hired as lumberjacks less than a week ago. Bill, are you sure of that? Oh, of course. Here's our pictures on the handbill. I couldn't be wrong. Yeah, where are they now? Oh, let me take a look at the worksheet. Yeah. They're up at number two sawmill this very minute. It's about a mile back from the river. We'd better wire Preston right away for instructions. Bill says they're dangerous. Okay, but we've got some tough lumberjacks, too. We can take them into custody. Uh, let me get at that telegraph key. Won't take long to get to Preston. Bill Boyd sent the message, and a few minutes later, the telegraph instrument began to click out Preston's reply. The telegrapher copied it on the back of the handbill. What's he say, Bill? Uh, here it is. Read it. Uh, take prisoners into custody. We'll start up river immediately. Take them off your hands. Congratulations. Signed, Preston. Sergeant N.W.M.P. Uh, now, Cliff, uh, we'll lock up the office, uh, and we'll pick up a couple of tough lumberjacks and go after that pair. Right. Got a gun, haven't you? Sure. How about you? Uh, I'll get it. It's here in the desk. I'll put the payroll in the safe. Let that bag alone, mister. Uh, get your hands up. Both of you. Hey. Get them up and keep them there. Keep them covered while I tie them up. Hey, go ahead. I'll watch them. It took Punkin but a few moments to bind the two company men with a line he had taken from one of the boats he and Fuzzy Walters had scuttled. As he finished, Fuzzy said, Now pick up that bag and let's get out of here. Hey, where'd this come from? Yeah, what's the matter? Take a look at this. The law circular with our pictures. Now you guys explain that. Where'd you get it? Oh, shut up, Punkin. They'd lie about it and we ain't got time to bother with them. They'll telegraph Dawson. No, they won't. A wire parallels the river. When we get downstream a few miles, we'll cut the wire. That'll stop that. Yeah. Nobody will find them for a couple of hours at least. Now pick up the bag and let's shove off. Right. Well, if their boat scuttled and the telegraph line cut, we'll make a clean getaway. Hey, you bet we will. Now let's get that launch started and get out of here. All right, Punkin, get in the boat. Yeah. Uh, I'll be... You take the tiller. I'll turn over the motor. Let it go, Pumpkin. 
Hang on. Here we go. While Fuzzy Walters and Punkin Adams headed the paymaster's launch downstream, Sergeant Preston and his great dog, King, were boarding their own patrol boat moored at the landing in Dawson. All right, boys. Get out of the way now. That's the bounty was about to start the motor when he heard a familiar voice calling his name. Hey, Sergeant. Huh? Sergeant Preston. Well, hello there, Ezra. Howdy, Sergeant. Hello, King. I didn't know you were in Dawson. Where's Maggie? Up on the claim, Sergeant. Are you going up river? Yes, King and I are bound for the lumber camp at Porcupine, going after a couple of prisoners. Uh, could you take me along as far as my getting off place? Why, certainly, Ezra. Glad to have you. Come aboard. Oh, well, that's mighty nice. I'll sure feel a lot safer than if I went back for trail. Safer? Yep. I'm carrying a fortune. Huh? I don't want to get robbed before I get back to Maggie. I wondered why you were carrying a gun. I never saw you with one before. Nobody's going to get my fortune without a fight. No, sir. Not after I trudged all the way to Dawson to get it. People usually bring gold to Dawson, not take it away. Uh, this ain't gold, Sergeant. Oh? No? Nope. It's eggs. Cold storage eggs. Ezra, do you mean to say you've been buying eggs at Dawson prices? A hundred dollars an egg, and I've got a dozen of them. <laughs> you must like eggs. Oh, no. But I, I do love Maggie, and she wanted them. I see. Well, Ezra, we'll get the motor started, and you can tell me all about it as we head up river. <laughs> Meanwhile, Fuzzy Walters and Punk Adams had traveled several miles downriver to a point where the telegraph line closely paralleled the shore. Fuzzy maneuvered the launch into the mud bank and waited while Punkin went ashore and cut the wires. A few moments later, he returned, confident that the last obstacle to their escape had been eliminated. Well, Fuzzy, that takes care of the telegraph line. They won't get a message through to Dawson today. No, they won't, eh? Now, come here and look at this. Now, what's the matter? We didn't see what was on the back of this handbill. Read it. Take prisoners in custody. We'll start up river immediately to take them off your hand. Congratulations. Preston! Holy smoke! That means a paymaster and the clerk had already spotted us and wired Preston and Dawson. He's probably heading up river right now. Yeah, you bet he is. A lucky thing I took another look at that handbill. We wouldn't be expecting to run into him, but he'd be laying for us. What do we do, Fuzzy? Sink this launch right here, where it'll never be found. Then we'll take the money and head east into the hills. We'll continue our story in just a moment. Say, tomorrow morning, you'll go for this family breakfast treat. I mean crisp, tender, swell-tasting Quaker Puff rice or Quaker Puff wheat. The ready-to-serve cereal shot from gun. Hey, you, hey, what goes on here? Stop it. Me, big Indian chief. Me on warpath. On the warpath? Look, chief, not now, not here. You, pale face. You start shooting. (laughs) Oh, look, Chief, I wasn't shooting, honest. That shooting you just heard was just me explaining about the keenest tasting breakfast ever, namely Quaker Puff rice and Quaker Puff wheat. Oh. You see, Chief, we load huge guns with choice, sun-ripened premium grains of rice or wheat. Then these guns are exploded. Out come big, giant grains eight times normal size. They're magnified, glorified... Crispified. That's why Quaker Puff rice and Quaker Puff wheat are bigger and better tasting. Oh. For breakfast or for lunch or supper, you just pour out a bowl full right from the package and add milk or cream and top with fruit. Mm. And what's more, Quaker Puff rice and Quaker Puff wheat are good for you. They furnish extra food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Ah. Well, Chief, how about it? Me trade bow and arrow. For a gun that shoots Quaker puffed rice, Quaker puffed wheat. And a boy. But look, that's not necessary. You can get rice or wheat shot from guns at your grocer's. And, Chief, uh-huh. here's a tip it's never sold in bags or bulk. Always buy the big red and blue Quaker package. Me walk mild to trading post for package any day. <laughs> <laughs> Fellas and girls, remember. 
That famous big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front is your guarantee that you're getting this swell breakfast treat. The one and only Quaker Puff Rice and Quaker Puff Wheat. And now to continue our story. Fuzzy and Punkin opened the petcock in the bottom of the launch and waited until the boat was parched full of water. Then Fuzzy wadded up the identification poster and tossed it to the slanting deck. Okay, Punkin. Get ashore with that bag of money. Here you go. All right, here I come. Now let's shove her off the mud so she'll sink in deep water. Right. right. There. Yeah, we got her off just in time. She's sinking. <laughs> yeah, won't be long before she goes down to Davy Jones' locker. Yeah, pick up the bag and let's get going. All right. I don't like this idea of heading into the hills without supplies. Well, I got them somewhere. Don't worry about it. <laughs> well, now Preston and his dog will get sore eyes looking for us on the river. <laughs> it was midsummer, and the winding valley of Indian River was a reflection of its resplendent glory. Swans sailed leisurely overhead as the patrol boat with Sergeant Preston, Ezra Sims, and King nosed steadily upstream. King seemed to be enjoying the trip most of all, barking defiantly at the swans overhead and the flocks of mallards that glided gracefully out of his range on the surface of the river. Presently, Sergeant Preston pointed a finger at some multicolored splotches floating on the water. See those splotches of color on the water, Ezra? Yes, Sergeant. I've just been looking at them myself. What are they? Oil. Uh, Where'd oil come from? Some passing boat, very likely. When a boat engine gets old, it starts wasting oil. Yeah, I guess that's... Oh, King, you know you can't catch one of them ducks. Ah, Hey, take off before you can get loose. It's not a duck he's interested in. Something floating on the water ahead there. Oh, yes, I see it. He's going to try to grab it as it floats by. Careful there, King. Don't fall off, boy. Say, he's got it. Good boy, King! <laughs> Having retrieved the bit of flotsam, King turned proudly toward his master to exhibit his prize. So you want me to see it, eh, fella? Very well, let's have it. Uh, piece of wadded up paper, that's all it is. Hasn't been in the water long, not very wet. What? I wonder where this came from. Uh, what's the matter? What is it? This stumps me, Ezra. It's a police poster describing the two prisoners I'm going upriver to get. Let's see. Here. I sent that poster to the lumber camp at Porcupine. The paymaster took it. How do you know it's the same one? They were only printed yesterday. It's the only one I sent out of town. Hey, Sergeant, there's something written here on the back. Huh? That's it. What? That's the message I telegraphed up there this morning saying to take the men in custody and I'd be up to get them. But, well, I'll be dead blamed. And we're miles from that there lumber camp. Yes, I know we are. I can't understand it. Now, ain't that just my luck? What do you mean? Just when things start to get mystifying and exciting... I've got to get off. Oh, I forgot you're not going all the way with King and me. Wish I was. But if you'll pull in the shore where the bank slopes down yonder, I'll head cross country and get home to Maggie. Your cabin's about seven miles from the river, isn't it, Ezra? Yeah, it's about it. I'll be home in time for Maggie to have her eggs for supper. <laughs> Cold storage eggs worth four <laughs> times their weight in gold. Oh, I hope she enjoys them. Well, she better. <laughs> As the launch nosed into the muddy bank and the miner prepared to step ashore, King bounded ahead of him and began sniffing the ground. Take it easy, Ezra. Don't slip and break those eggs. Uh, You bet I'll be careful. (laughs) Hey, Sergeant. Yes? Here in the mud, somebody's pushed in here with a boat today. Huh? Yes, you're right. There's the marks of the prowl. And a lot of footprints in the mud, too. That's not all, Ezra. Look over there. Uh, Oil. Coming to the surface of the river, there's a boat sunk there. Well, I'll be dead blessed. Now, what do you make of that, sir? I don't know, Ezra. Completely bewildered by their rapid discoveries, both men looked at each other for an answer. For a moment, the sergeant's eyes turned toward the shore, as if he expected to see someone who might explain the strange set of circumstances. Presently, he pointed to a telegraph pole. Look over there, Ezra. I think I have the answer. Uh, what is it? I don't see nothing. The telegraph line's been cut. Well, I'll be doggone if it hasn't. Now, who in thunder'd scuttle a boat and cut the telegraph line? I think I can answer that. 
Where's the police poster King got out of the river? Oh, it's right there on the deck behind you. Oh, yes, I see it. Uh, take this line and make the launch fast, will you? Yep, sure. I'll fix it. That'll do her. What are you going to do with that handbill? I'll show you. Here, King. Easy now, fella. Don't get excited. Got a scent of this paper. There now. What's King up to now? Watch him. Why, he's sniffing them tracks. I thought that was it. Follow them, King. Say, look at him go. Well, who in thunder do you suppose he's after? It's my guess. He's after Fuzzy Wallers and Punkin' Adams. But you said they was prisoners at Porcupine. When I left Dawson, I presume they were. But something must have gone wrong now. Come on, Ezra. Let's follow King. Yeah, he's <coughs> to wait while we catch up with him. You might see some excitement after all. Coming, King! It was nearing sundown when Fuzzy Walters and Punkin' Adams emerged from the heavy timber into a clearing. For nearly a mile, they had been guided there by a thin column of smoke that slid upward into the windless sky. I thought we'd find a cabin at the bottom of that streak of smoke. You were right. There it is, Fuzzy. Uh, what are you going to say if they start asking questions? Hey, you leave that to me. I've been thinking up a good story. Be quiet now. Better knock on the door instead of calling out. Yeah, I will. Howdy, ma'am. Goodness alive. I was wondering if that was my Ezra, back from Dawson already. <laughs> Figured he must have grown wings to get back before tomorrow. <laughs> well, uh, what can I do for you? Well, we had a little accident back there on the river. Wondered if you could help us out. Accident, you say? Yeah. Oh. Me and my partner here were traveling by canoe. We put ashore to look over some mining possibilities, and the current caught the canoe and swept it downstream. With uh, about everything we had there named. Grub and uh, mining equipment, you know. Oh, now that's too bad. We saw the smoke from your cabin, so we thought you could fix us up with supplies to last us ooh, a few days. Of course, we'll pay you well. We don't expect it for nothing. Oh, of course. Oh, now, now. I wouldn't think of taking money from prospectors who've had a streak of bad luck. I know what that means. Me and Ezra have mined all our lives, and we've had plenty of bad luck. Now, you just come right in here. Make yourselves at home. Well, that's mighty nice of you, ma'am. I was just getting supper ready, and I reckon there's plenty for all three of us. It sure smells good, ma'am. And after supper, I'll pack your bag with supplies the last a week. We have ample for ourselves. Sit down, won't you? Oh, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> oh, I'm sure tired. Must be all of ten miles from the river to here. It's seven, but carrying a big bag like the one you've got makes it seem long. <laughs> yes, but sure it does. Will you just rest your feet while I go in the kitchen and put two more plates on the table? And I'll warm up some more victuals so there'll be plenty to go around. Hey, Pumpkin. Yeah, Fuzzy? Do you see what I see here on this table? Let's see. Gold. Raw gold. Someone's been weighing it up. They must have plenty to scatter it around like this. You ain't lying. What do we do, Fuzzy? Grab the old lady, tie her up, and then search the shack. And it's my guess we'll find it right over there. You mean them loose stones in the fireplace? Yeah, I saw them when I first came in. Now get a sheet off that bed in the corner, rip it, and use it to tie up the old gal. Yeah. Hey, what's going on in here? Stop ripping that sheet. Grab her! Come here, you! Oh, you thieving poke! Hurry, Fuzzy, help me! Oh, oh, no, it took but a few moments to subdue Maggie Sims and tie her to a chair. And it took less time to remove the loose stones in the fireplace. Behind them, Fuzzy and Pumpkin found two sacks of gold dust and nuggets. <laughs> there must be all of $50,000 in gold there. <laughs> all of it. Added to what we got in the bag, we can retire, Fuzzy. Your <laughs> the mountains will get you. You won't know about it if they do, old lady. And you're not going to tell them anything. You, you're not going to kill me. Dead folks don't oh. tell tales. Oh. Hey, Pumpkin. Yank that tick off the bed and rip it open. Why don't you shoot her? I want this to look like an accident. Now, yank off that tick. Yeah. There. Yeah, here's the gold. Put in the bag while I strike a match and set fire to the straw tick. Yeah. Oh, you murdering cowman. There you are. And when your old man comes home tomorrow, you'll find nothing but ashes. There'll be no evidence that we've done it. Come on, Fuzzy. <coughs> that bed taking is burning fast. Yeah. Let's get out of here. Come back here. Come back. <laughs> See you again come judgment day, baby. Open the door. I can't see it. Get some things. Hey, get some money. Put your hands up. Maggie. Maggie. Shoot him, Fuzzy. Shoot him. No, you don't. Oh, the gun. Maggie. 
Hold him, gang. Hold him, boy. Now give me that gun. I quit here. Here's my gun. Ezra, get that burning bed sticking out of here. Maggie, she's tied up. Get that bedding out before the cabin catches fire. Right now. Here, I'll drag it out. Obeying Sergeant Preston's command, Ezra Sims dragged the burning bedding to the door and kicked it into the yard as King and the sergeant stood guard over Fuzzy Walters and Punkin Adams. Then together they freed Maggie from her bonds and the cabin rapidly cleared of smoke. Half an hour later, Sergeant Preston and Ezra entered the kitchen to find Maggie cooking supper as if nothing had happened. Maggie, the environments confessed everything. They'd held up the lumber company this morning. They're handcuffed to the bed for the time being, Maggie. King's standing guard over them. Well, we can all thank our lucky stars that King found that handbill floating on the river. If he hadn't, I'd been burned to a crisp by now. Hey, you be careful with them eggs, Maggie. Don't burn them to a crisp. Them things cost a hundred dollars each. It cost a darn sight more than that, Ezra. With your skirmishing around, you busted eight of them. I... Oh, my. Twelve hundred dollars for four eggs. Look. It's high price eating, but it's going to be worth it. <laughs> you cooking all four at one time? Of course I am. Just one apiece. One apiece? And me and you and Sergeant Preston? That's only three. Who's the other four? King, of course. Oh, sure enough. After what King did for me today, he's going to get the best in the house. Here, King. Come and get it right. <laughs> How about it, Sergeant Preston? Wouldn't you say King had earned his supper? Why, yes, Maggie, I guess he has. Thanks to King, this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Say, if you can't make up your mind which you like best, Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice, here's what you do. Don't miss out on either kind of these delicious, ready-to-serve cereals. Always keep a supply of both kinds on hand. Eat Quaker puffed wheat one time, Quaker puffed rice the next. Wheat or rice shot from guns is never sold in bags or bulk. Be sure to look at the big red and blue Quaker package. That's the only way to get the original, crisp, fresh, Quaker puffed wheat, and Quaker puffed rice. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and supervised by Charles D. Livingston. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the killer. On one of my trips to Dawson, I heard whispered talk that led me to believe men were planning an illegal dogfight. I asked Kenny, a boy of 12, to help me verify my hunch. I should never have done that because Kenny came within a hair's breadth of losing his life in his efforts to aid the law. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure... Friday. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Yes, the giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Still less than one penny a serving. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice. So long. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company.